Uh, if you would turn with me to Luke chapter 5, going to start in verse 17 today. Remove the roof is the title of today's message. If you stand with me as we read God's word today. Verse 17. One day Jesus was preaching, and Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. Some men carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do so because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. When they saw their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, Who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, Why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take up your mat, and go home. Immediately, he stood up onto his feet, took what he had been laying on, and went home praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, we have seen remarkable things today. Father, thank you so much for your word today. We thank you for giving it to us to share and Father, uh, not just to share, but to present the truth. And God, I pray that you would help us to receive that truth today. God, help us to remove the roof around our hearts and minds so that we can process the truth today. In Jesus' name, amen. I've been up in debate this week about how to present this message, and I thought about using a story to develop um, this passage more in depth, but I don't want to present this as if I'm adding to Scripture in any way. There are some that may confuse this and, and recognize, oh, you're adding to Scripture. You don't need to be adding to Scripture. You, the Scripture says don't add or take away anything to the Scripture. Well, I'm not doing that, and I don't want to and present it as if I am adding to Scripture in any way. However, my purpose in presenting this story is to highlight the principles of the passage of the paralytic man and to teach what Jesus was really saying in those passages. And sometimes doing it in a story form hits harder, hits home. Jesus used stories when he taught because it was a way to to make it practical in their lives. So, I'm going to go ahead and give you the principles of the story, but then as I retell the story, we're going to pick up on some of these principles. So, number one, the first principle is sin corrupts and destroys us. I hope we can all agree on that. Sin corrupts and destroys us. Number two, faith in Christ heals us. And then, number three, Christ is God, who alone has the power to forgive our sin. Three very basic principles that are found in this story. But what I want to do is to present this story in kind of a new light. I'm going to retell the story from the perspective of one of the friends of the paralytic. All right, we're going to call him Joshua. Now, Joshua was not his actual name. You can go back to that previous slide, Jesse. We're going to be there for a while. Joshua is not his actual name. We don't know any of the names of the characters, but we're going to give them some names so we can keep up with who's who. Okay? Now, let me get into character real quick. All right. My parents were devout Jews. 
I grew up in a house that was purely devoted to worshiping the one true God, Yahweh. At least that's what we think we call him. We don't really know how to pronounce his actual name. It's been lost through the years, but we call him Yahweh, the great I am, the one who created everything, who appeared to Abraham and established the patriarchs and appeared to Moses and brought our people out of Egypt. We were good Jews. We went to all the Jewish festivals like Passover, the festival of unleavened bread and Pentecost and booths and you name it, we were there. But of course, living in this Jewish community during this time, not, things were not like they should have been. They called this the promised land, but it didn't seem very good. The Romans were really the ones in charge. Romans were cruel and arrogant, blasphemous even. They hated us. We didn't want anything to do with them. They didn't want anything to do with us. We also had the religious elite there, Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, the Sadducees. Sometimes they were in conflict with one another, the, the priests even in the temple. And all of these people were, they, they, they kind of ruled over us with an iron fist. Nonetheless, we were all, us Jews at least, were awaiting the promised Messiah. I had a small group of friends. This was my posse, my boys. We worked together, we played together, we lived together. We were very close in proximity of our houses. There were about five of us. We have Dan, Ben, Joseph, Micah, and myself, Joshua. Well, a few years ago, something awful happened. Ben fell off the roof of his house, landed on his back. He became paralyzed from the neck down. I remember the story pretty well. Ben asked if I could come help him replace some tiles in the roof because he had a leak. Of course, I would love to help him. Well, little did I know and little did he know the danger that was approaching we noticed a storm cloud was coming. Winds kept picking up. So we were trying to hurry, but the wind got there before we were finished and picked up so bad it ended up um, blowing Ben off the roof. He tried to stand up, and the wind caught him at just the right time, and he fell off the roof and hit the ground, and he yelled. When I finally got to, able to look over the edge, and he was yelling, but he wasn't moving. And then I heard silence. So I hurried down, and by that time I'm yelling for his wife, and finally got to him, and he came to after being unconscious for a second, and he said, I can't feel anything. I can't move anything. And my heart sank. I knew what that meant. He became paralyzed from the neck down. Well, Dan, Joseph, Micah, and I, we tried to help him and his family the best we could. Doctors couldn't find a cure. They couldn't do anything. No other person could heal him. We tried all kinds of things. One day, as we were all together with Ben, eating dinner, he shared something with us. We were trying to lighten the mood and telling jokes and all these kind of things, but he just began to weep. And Ben's not a weeper. And he said, I know why God did this to me. Because several years ago, I began to drink pretty heavily. And I just kept drinking and getting drunk and it became a habit, but I only did it in the privacy of my own home where I thought nobody would see. I believed it helped me cope with life and the stresses of life. And I lost control. Then we hit some financial struggles. And we were in such need of money, I, I did some things I regret. One thing in particular, after I was drunk one night, I uh, went outside and I see a, a guy roaming the streets and I robbed him and beat him. He was bleeding all over. And I broke his leg so he couldn't chase me. I threw him in the bushes. And I don't really know what whatever happened to him. But when I got home that night, I just started to shake. And just think to myself, what did I do? 
What did I do? Ben was ashamed that night. But he continued. He said, so fellas, don't feel bad for me. I deserve what I got. God won't forgive me. There's no sacrifice I can give to pay for that. I'm doomed. So guys, you can just move on. As time went on, Ben grew more and more bitter and was losing hope. But I wasn't. In fact, my hope, my hope grew stronger. I had recently heard of a man from Nazareth named Jesus. And he was doing some incredible miracles. He came to my hometown in Capernaum. And he started to cast out demons and heal people that were sick and blind and deaf and lame. I wondered if he could be the Messiah. He was at least a prophet. There have been others claiming to be the Messiah too, but they were not legit, so I was a little skeptical at this. Regardless, Jesus' Jesus's works were amazing. But then I heard him teach. He taught like nobody I've ever heard. He started teaching, and, and the words were even more powerful than his works. He taught with stories. He spoke like one in authority, like, like he was the one that actually wrote the Torah. He spoke of the prophets as if he knew them personally. It was hard for me to wrap my head around. Jesus was only in my hometown just for a little while, but he left. And I heard that he went to his hometown in Nazareth. And oh boy, the stories that went on there. I began my investigation. Y'all remember John the Baptist, right? The baptizer who was in the wilderness. He ate the locusts. He's just a strange, odd dude. And his message was, repent, the kingdom of God had come. And then one day, John saw Jesus. And he said, look, the Lamb of God, the one who came to die for sins of the world. That statement startled me. Was this the Lamb of God? What does that even mean? I thought. I didn't, know, I didn't really know what it meant, so I just put that comment in my back pocket for later. But John obviously saw something new, something different about this man. I heard about the, the stories of Jesus in his hometown. Let me tell you. So Jesus one day went to the synagogue. And he started teaching in the synagogue from the prophet Isaiah. And essentially, to make a long story short, he just announced himself as the Messiah. The people of his hometown were like, give us a miracle, prove it. But he didn't do any miracles. I found that kind of strange. Since he did miracles in my hometown, why not his own? But for whatever reason, he chose not to do a miracle that day while he was at home. Nonetheless, the people of his hometown, they watched him grow up. They saw his character. They were acquainted more personally with Jesus than anybody else up to that point. They should have known something fishy about his birth, right? being born of a virgin and all. Nonetheless, they, they tried to throw him off a cliff. They were rioting, and they pushed him toward the cliff, and they were going to throw him off the cliff, and then Jesus, <laughs> Jesus just walked back through the crowd. Like, how did he do that? He just walked back through the crowd. Nobody said anything. Nobody did anything. He just said, "Miss, what my time. What kind of authority does this man have? Well, the next thing you know, I found uh, that Jesus was coming to our hometown again. Well, I went to my friends, Dan, Micah, and Joseph, and told them, told them about the stories of Nazareth and all that Jesus had ex has done and, and said up to that point. And they were amazed and they started gleaming with hope. And so I asked them, do you think this man could heal Ben? They said, absolutely. If Jesus is who he says he is, nothing's impossible for him. But we just need to get Ben on board. 
I said, well, it's not like he can stop us. <laughs> and we all laughed. We heard that he was coming to Capernaum, our hometown. And he was teaching at someone's house. So we had to really act fast because we didn't know at what point he was going to leave. And so uh, we went over to Ben and we tried to explain it to him. But Ben was a tough man. He was a stubborn man. He was a bitter man. We got to Ben's house to try to explain these things, and he was just a bit skeptical about it all. But we convinced him. We said, listen, Ben, honestly, what do you have to lose? What do you have to lose? And he finally agreed. We loaded him on the mat to carry him, and Ben had been, he'd been eating a little bit more than he should have. So I said, Ben, but we need to get you on a diet. You're getting heavy. And Ben just laughed and said, well, hopefully you won't have to carry me home. <laughs> when we arrived at the house Jesus was teaching in, there was a huge crowd there. And we couldn't even see Jesus. We could hear him vaguely. But the crowd was so big, we, we, there's no way we get, could get in. So I told Ben, who was kind of losing hope at this point, I said, Ben, listen, we are not leaving until we see Jesus. And so Dan and I were looking around trying to figure out the best way to, to get to Jesus. And Micah steps up and says, hey, guys, why don't we just like go onto the roof and we'll rip a hole in the roof and set Ben down right in front of Jesus. Dan looks at Micah and says, Micah, we can't just go around digging holes in people's roofs. People don't like that. <laughs> ben spoke up at that point and said, fellas. Last time I was on a roof, it did not go well. I'm not going to put you through that. We ain't going on a roof. Then Joseph said something. Now, Joseph was a, he's a quiet dude. He didn't say much. But when he did, you know it was important. So he, Joseph looked at Ben in the eyes and said, Ben, we believe Jesus will heal you. And if he can do that, then even if we fall off the roof, he can heal us too. Pretty good logic there, I thought. And with that, we all agreed we're going to go onto the roof and rip a hole in it. And oftentimes in the Jewish community where we stayed, there were, uh, the houses had stairs that went to the roof, and the rooftop was flat. And, which is not a, in hindsight, it's not a, the most practical place to, or how to build a house on a flat roof, because rain's just going to pull up. Anyway, it's neither here nor there. We went onto the roof. We started digging through the tiles and, Dirt was falling inside. I can only imagine what the people inside started thinking. This place is coming down. And then, you know, the light started to come through the roof. And we lowered Ben down right in front of Jesus. And everybody was just silent at that point. And then I saw Jesus. And we made eye contact. And I knew right then something amazing was about to happen. Jesus looked at us as if to say, good job, guys. I'm proud of you. I'm impressed by your faith. And he nodded. And then he looked at Ben. And Ben was not making eye contact with Jesus. He was just looking down. But Jesus looked at Ben. He knelt down and lifted up his head and said, friend, your sins are forgiven. Just how quiet it is right now, that's how quiet it was that day. No one said a word. We were all just in shock at what Jesus had just said. I thought, how in the world did Jesus know? Did he know what Ben did? How did he know that those were the very words that Ben needed to hear in that moment? Friend, your sins are forgiven. And then I thought, by what authority did Jesus have to announce the forgiveness of sins? What kind of man is this? Only Yahweh can forgive sins. Was Jesus saying what I think he was saying? Was he making himself equivalent to Yahweh? Then I looked over at Ben, 
He was beginning to tear up. I noticed some commotion around the crowd. Those Pharisees I told you about, those teachers of the law, they started kind of squirming in their seats. and Still nobody said anything. These were supposedly the pious teachers of the day. They try to keep everybody accountable to holding up to the Jewish law and their own traditions. They felt that they had the responsibility to vet out rabbis and teachers who were gathering crowds and doing all these miraculous or rumored miraculous things. You know, they felt personally responsible to make sure that the truth was being upheld and nobody was speaking falsely. So, they, of course, they would be interested in hearing what Jesus had to say. But they were very suspicious of Jesus. Then suddenly Jesus spoke up again, but it was like he was reading everybody's mind. Because nobody said anything. We must have been thinking too loud or something. And Jesus said, why are you thinking these things in your heart? Which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven. Or to say, get up and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has the authority to forgive sins. Of course, I've got to thinking after he said that. Of course, it's easier to say your sins are forgiven because we don't really know if the sins are forgiven or not. However, if he's going to say, get up and walk, well, we can judge what's about to happen, right? Whether or not he actually gets up and walks. If Jesus could not make the man walk, then it's doubtful that he is Yahweh, or at least operating under God's authority. And if he's not Yahweh, he cannot forgive sins. But if he is Yahweh, he can do both. Forgive sins and heal the man. Then Jesus looked directly at Ben and told him to get up, take up his mat and walk. Then Ben's muscles began to form together. And he started to move his hands and started to move his feet and move his legs. And he, then he just jumped up and started praising God. And everybody was clapping and praising God, except for the Pharisees, of course. But everybody else was clapping and carrying on. It was an awesome moment. And we, we left and we did what Jesus said. We praised God all the way home. When we got back home, I mean, we were just not silent about this thing. We were telling everybody on the way home, even when we got home, we're sharing all this story with our families and friends around. And we finally, things started to settle down around dinner time. Micah posed a question. He said, what do you think Jesus meant when he said, but I want you to know that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. What does he mean when he says the Son of Man? Well, Dan suggested, well, son of man just, doesn't it imply that he is just a human, like son of a man? As opposed to the son of God? Well, everybody's like, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Then Joseph said, hey, don't you remember that the prophet Daniel spoke about the son of man as a title for the Messiah? So Jesus could be referring to himself as the Messiah. And we're like, well, that's a possibility too. And then I said, well, perhaps Jesus left the statement vague on purpose. As if to say to the crowd, I'll let you decide. Am I the son of a man or the son of man? Am I just a human or something more? Then Ben aggressively said, He's the Messiah. Trust me. I know. About a week later, all the guys were walking and, and talking and we, as we worked in the field. and I had a thought. So I shared it with the boys. I said, Guys, I wonder if we are all like Ben. And then Dan, being the smart aleck he was, says, Joshua, I've never been paralyzed. <laughs> and I said, I mean spiritually. Spiritually, we are like Ben. We are all paralyzed like Ben. We can't heal ourselves. We can't do anything for ourselves. We need a healer. 
We need somebody to heal us. We need God's forgiveness spiritually. We're spiritually paralyzed because of sin, and we need God to forgive us. I believe we need to bring more people to Jesus. But not just the blind, the lame, the deaf, but everybody. Because we all are sinners in need of forgiveness. In scene. <laughs> now let me transition. I want to ask you, as you just heard the story, who do you relate to in the story? Who do you relate to? There's three options I want you to think of. Maybe you're like one of the religious leaders. The pious ones. Perhaps you're still skeptical about Jesus. You're just not sure what to make of him. You may not be sure that he ever existed. Or just not confident that he did miracles. Or maybe you just don't trust the Bible or trust all the testimonies about Jesus rising from the grave. If this is you, my challenge is keep asking questions but also seeking answers. Don't be satisfied with just asking a bunch of questions, but never actually seeking the answers. Don't be lazy, in other words. Seek the right answers. Don't make the fatal mistake of jumping to a conclusion before you've researched both sides of an issue. And also don't make the mistake to conclude that the truth cannot be known. You may not have 100% evidence to believe, but you don't need 100% evidence to believe. You need enough evidence to prove beyond reasonable doubt of something's true. Before deciding your conclusion, make sure you research both sides of an issue. And then you can come to an intelligent conclusion. Maybe you're like the religious leader. Or you're like the paralytic, like Ben. Maybe you've done something so bad or have done so many things that you feel that you cannot be forgiven. Or maybe you feel unworthy of God's forgiveness. Can I be honest with you? Can I be honest with you? No one is worthy of of God's forgiveness. No one. However, God presents the universal offer, the gift of forgiveness to everyone who is willing to receive. He has given the offer to everyone to respond in faith because of what Jesus did on the cross. We can have forgiveness through Jesus. Well, how do we receive that forgiveness? Well, we need to believe that Jesus is who He says He is, that He did what He said He did, and He's going to do what He said He's going to do. Jesus claimed to be God. He died for our sins, and He rose again, and He's coming back one day. We believe the right things about Jesus, but we also understand that we are sinners in need of a Savior. But the last thing, probably the most difficult is to confess Jesus as Lord of our life, which entails turning from our sins, to go and sin no more, to repent, to turn from our sins. We can't continue to live in sin and then call Jesus our Lord. If we live in sin and call Jesus our Lord, we are really serving two masters, which we cannot do because we'll either hate one and love the other. Perhaps you're like the friends, the last option. Church, I have just brought all of you to Jesus today through this message. And Jesus is willing and ready to forgive anyone who trusts in him. But I wonder, who do you know that you need to bring to Jesus? Who do you know that needs forgiveness of the Lord. 
Who do you know that is spiritually paralyzed or dead that needs to receive salvation? Who can you help remove the roof of their heart so that they can be confronted with Christ? Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for this message today. We pray that you would help us to be sensitive to you and how you're dealing with us, God. God, if we are in any way like the religious leaders, help us to confront that with ourselves and to deal with it. If we are like the paralytic in need of salvation, God, bring that conviction and that understanding to our, to our minds and hearts, God, and help us to receive the forgiveness of Christ and repent of our sins. And God, if we relate to the friends, Father, I pray you would bring those people to our minds this week that we can be open and honest before them to present them to Jesus, to help knock down the roofs, the barriers that are preventing them from coming to know Christ. God, to answer their tough questions and to just be a friend to them, a genuine concerned friend. God, you know how to deal with us, and I pray you would do so today. In Jesus' name, amen.